Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I thought this was the baby's room. I'm really sorry. I was in the pool. I was in the pool. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Jug Life Podcast. I'm Chad Wesley Smith, joined, as always, by... Uh, Miraculous Max Montana, the birthday oh, yeah. boy. That's I figure right. you're like a, 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 a immaculate Max Montana. Immaculate. You're an immaculate conception, no? <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, who knows? Hey, uh, we are coming to you from JDI Barbell <laughs> in New York, the borough of Queens. Now you can cheer again because I said Queens. You're a little early. All right. Yeah, we just finished up a little uh, quick snatch workshop, and now we're going to be talking about uh, time to fixation. So that's you know a fancy word for us to sound smarter than we really are. Talking about how to go under the bar better. So today's episode is brought to you by Mob Deep Squats. That's a Queen Queensbridge <laughs> lifestyle, or Queens and Power Cleans. Either either one. I th thought the Mob Deep Squats one is better, but <laughs> yeah. So Matt. Max, what is time to fixation, and, and how do we go about assessing our weightlifting technique to know if that's an area that we struggle in? So, so when we're talking about time to fixation, the reason we, what we're really talking about is like speed under the bar, how fast you are going from exerting vertical force in the bar to moving under the bar and catching it. The reason we say time to fixation is because you could be really, really fast under the bar, but if you have hesitations in the movement from pulling to catching or pulling to moving under, meaning you pause or you stop, or you're, you're moving in a horizontal direction that maybe increases the amount of time it takes or the bar trajectory is off, you're not actually, it's not a good example to say just speed under the bar. But for all intents and purposes, we're just talking about moving under the bar fast, how fast you are at moving under the weight. So, uh, you know, in terms of like, Lamer, well, in layman's terms, right, speed on the bar, maximizing that through two different things. One is actually moving fast under the weight, so increasing some things that maybe limit you from moving fast, like dynamic flexibility, squatting deeper, mobility stuff, and then technical fixes like pulling correctly, being in the right position, being in the right place at the right time, and then eliminating little hesitations or flaws in timing under the bar, right? So as, as a lifter, not with my own lifting, because obviously flawless snatch technique, that's why they call me Snatch Wesley Smith. <laughs> the, uh, what would be indicative, as you, as you look at a lifter's technique, indicative that they are lacking in this area, time so, to fixation? So the, the two biggest things you're going to see with people that, are, that have trouble moving the bar are going to be either they, they power snatch or power clean as much as they do in the full lifts, meaning they're not moving under the bar really at all, or their speed under the bar is almost negligible because they're, they're lifting the same weight they could lift to a higher height. Uh, and then people that have the bar crash on them a lot. So if you clean and you rock it to the bottom, but the bar is still up here and it comes down on you and crashes on you, um, another example of that. So Those it's, are, it's the, not just about how fast can I go under it, it's also the the... Yeah. The timing of it. Well, yeah, it's like, it's really, we have two ways of looking at it. One is optimizing it, meaning making it ideal, moving under the bar at the right rhythm, the right speed, the right tempo, being in the right place, and then maximizing it, meaning moving under the bar as fast as possible, receiving the bar in the best position at the bottom. Those two examples kind of contrast a little bit. One of them is suited a little bit more to, like, we look at, like, a clean, for example. You want to optimize speed under the bar and receiving position because it's going to be more critical to be in the right position at the bottom of a clean so that you can stand from the bottom because some people don't have super, super strong legs versus maximizing your speed under the bar in order to get down to the bottom so low, so fast that you can, you know, receive a weight that was only pulled just barely, you know, above your belt line. Whereas in the snatch, maximizing that, we want to really capitalize on being able to get under the bar as fast as possible, as low as possible so we can obviously lift more weight. Makes sense? All right, so before we get into uh, showing you some of the exercises you can do to improve this, we're going to take a quick break so we can hear from our sponsors. I'm not going to talk about them now. So break. 
And then we'll do a, like a quick little trivia so you can win something. We're, you're going to test your, your juggernaut, team juggernaut knowledge. So four pair of juggernaut virus socks. Ooh, socks. <laughs> Everyone loves socks. <laughs> it is, someone's eyes lit up. Yes. What? Ooh. Where's Timberland? What rugged state is Max from? <laughs> wow. Oh, this guy follows rules and raises his hand. It's a lot like it's Montana. It's a lot like Jeopardy, guys. That didn't fly very well. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's I forgot I would ask him in the Jeopardy way. I should have asked it as uh, this. Uh, Max shares a middle name with this northern mm. state, something like that. What is this northern state? I was uh, born in a log cabin. Who knows? That's true. I thought you were born in New York. No, no, no. My parents were born in New York. Oh, all my okay. parents, all my family is from from Jersey. I try not to tell people that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good place. To, it's a good place to be from, right? <laughs> all right. For a copy of Max's book, The Weightlifting Technique Triad, which talks about time to fixation, and then the other two factors, bar height and bar trajectory, this one will be, be harder. You'd have to be a real juggernaut fan to know this one. Um, when Max was training the Bulgarian system, how many maximum front squats did he do in a week? No. Almost. <laughs> 30. Yes. This guy knows that it, it's because he knows that every day is leg day. Yeah. <laughs> 30, 30 maximum front squats. I never had any knee pain. No knee, no back problems. Just emotional? Oh my God. <laughs> you can tell? Is it showing? Is it showing? For the Jug Life snapback, what weight did Team Juggernaut lifter Kiana Welch snatch for the American record? Uh, the one that counted less? Oh, oh. Sorry. Oh. Well, you can go with both. I guess both. 108, 109. Yeah, one, so 108 for the record, 109 for what should be the record. Huh, any other good questions here? Does anyone know how tall is Alyssa Ritchie? Four, four even, yes. Four feet tall. Four feet tall. Knee high to a grasshopper. Huh? Four ten and a half. Four ten and a half is the answer. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah, gonna I, need to make sure we put your name on a list of stalker potential for <laughs> Ritchie. I know a lot about her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, back back to the back to business. All right, so we are back with our uh, Jug Life Live episode from JDI Barbell in Queens, New York. <laughs> Hopefully, the mics picked that sound up. You're supposed to pan wildly with the camera. Oh, good. That's good, Charlie. You plan you plan to head for only this. Getting your bald spots. <laughs> mine, mine too. The two of us just has like two shiny spots right there. <laughs> That's gonna be, so there's been a lot of uh, accusations, uh, I, I guess, about my my hairline. A lot of. <laughs> Did, I mean, how many of you guys have seen the, the podcast where Chad, the hair dysmorphia one? One, we got one real fan here. So yeah. Chad's like, as people have been saying, I have like this hairline. Like Mark Bell's like, my hair's all messed up. Like, bring the camera over here, Shorty. <laughs> Shreddy brings a camera over and well, I could see it on a, on a he monitor. He grabs the monitor and he looks and he's like, suddenly he realized, like, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> was, I, I was like, I bring that camera, like, as you get up closer, you know, it, it must not be reading well from farther, farther out. And then the camera came in closer and I had a lot of realizations. It's a Krusty the Clown scenario. Yeah. <laughs> it's hanging on, this little, this is, a, I call my, my baby duck hair right here. It's very, very soft and fragile. It's like down feathers. Yeah, down feathers and it's holding on for dear life. It's once if I lose maybe half half an inch there, there's like the 18 hairs here holding on. Yeah. And once once those go, then the whole thing's got to go. <laughs> uh, so back to time to fixation. Um, 
We've talked about what it is. Uh, now Max is going to show you how to improve it with the assistance yeah. so of Kimmy. The, the, some of the basic drills we would do, obviously, you're always going to snatch, right? You, you got to clean, you got to snatch. Those things don't ever leave the program. But as additional exercises to help fix this and to emphasize those things, the two biggest things we're going to do is, is basically distort the, the length of the pull. So doing things from blocks at different heights. We're not going to actually use blocks, but when you change the distance the bar is going to move from the ground towards your hips, you reduce the ability to accelerate the bar, right? Which is going to force you into a position where you have to move a little bit faster on the bar, or at least psychologically you have to be more aggressive moving under the weight. So any things like high blocks where the bar is very high against your, your thigh above the knee, um, and then snatches from the hang, right? Snatches from the hang done in a reactive way where you lower the bar, then immediately pull rather than pausing and then moving under. So actually a full snatch. Okay. Come on, Kimmy. <laughs> so, so those exercises are really good because they change the, the time factor in the pull, right? Now we have a short, condensed, explosive pull, forcing ourselves to move under the bar. If you're really slow under the bar, if you do things like power snatch more than you snatch, you're going to be in a position where those weights are basically the same. You're snatching, you know, maybe a couple kilos more than you power snatch. So you might have a really hard time doing things like hang snatches or block snatches, especially from a high position. You're going to want to power those too. So in anything, when you're training for technique, the amount of work you do at really heavy weights has to change, has to shift to lower intensities so you can actually do the lift correctly, right? We can't become really proficient lifters if we're doing shitty snatches at 90, 95%, and then reinforcing bad motor patterns with high intensity. So obviously you're going to do this with lighter weights, more volume, more repetitions per set. As you do more repetitions per set, those last repetitions in the set, you know, two or three and above, are going to be more fatiguing. And they're going to relax you a little bit more, so you're forced to go under the bar a little better. Or you can capitalize on that more, because now you're in a little bit more fatigue state, you can focus on speed under rather than trying to be aggressive and pulling on the bar. Does that make sense? The other thing that I like to do, and the sort of a big one I think that's pretty common, uh, more common now, not so common when I started lifting, was um, eliminating the contact. Because a lot of times what happens is people are relying so much solely on generating power with their hips, they don't develop the tempo of moving under the bar. Okay? They may make contact with their hips, they may kick the bar forward, Obviously, fixing just bad mechanics is the first step. But beyond that, no contact snatches. And we call them no contact snatches. Probably some people always refer to them as muscle snatches. But basically, snatching without making contact with the body. No second pull, uh, so to speak. Of So we would do them into a full squat position always. The bar is never touching your body at the top. The extension has to be complete. And in doing that, you basically force a position where you're delaying the time to go under the bar and then exaggerating the speed under the bar. Because when you pull past your hips, you're going to feel like there's no chance to possibly go under. And then you have to be a little more aggressive and, and turn the weight over. Okay? So do a couple no contact snatch. Extend a little more. Yeah. Do it a little more exaggerated where it's just farther away from you so you can see. Yeah. So same kind of thing. Things like no contact snatches, if you're somebody who does who pulls for too long and has a really big delay, you pull forever and then drop under, you're already mimicking that action. So doing no contact snatches, if you have issues where there's a big hesitation at the top, may just exaggerate it. So I would suggest something more like reducing the weight and doing more block snatches, more hang snatches, those kind of things. In addition to, in addition to these main movements, when you're training them you know, one or two times a week, and then you also have you know, regular snatches one or two times a week, you would do other drills, things like drop snatches and snatch balances. They may not make you faster under the bar. I mean, it's not the same movement, right? You're not going from pulling to catching. You're going from driving or standing to catching. It's a good exercise and a good drill to teach footwork and handwork and, and get you comfortable with what that sensation is uh, supposed to feel like when you catch the weight. But I wouldn't assume that doing drop snatches or snatch balances is going to make you faster under the bar. Make sense? Um, it can help in the f in if you're really soft or catching the wrong place, but not something that's going to transfer as much. 
the actual lift and the higher specificity exercises like hang snatch, high block snatch, no contact snatch, those kind of things are going to have a much bigger transference to actually moving to the bar faster. One more thing to remember is that a lot of these changes are subtle. You're, you're taking lifting technique. You're not going to go do this exercise and then I look like a different lifter. It's do this exercise, understand that there's a shift in technique and an emphasis on something, right? You're not going to go from, oh, I'm like, I move at, you know, half a meter a second under the bar. Now I do no contact snatch. I move three meters a second under the bar. That's just not going to happen. It's, it's more like, oh, I feel what it's like to be fast under the bar into the receiving position, or I, you know, or I feel what it's like to, to pull for a long time and finish the pull, and then immediately transition under the bar. And then you use these exercises in conjunction with actually doing snatches and clean and jerks. If you just spent your whole time doing this, only these exercises, you may not have the same transference to the actual list because you've just distorted the technique to get this effect, but you're not practicing the skill along with it, the actual skill of lifting. Does that make sense, everybody? Um, in the clean, we talk about like optimizing things. When we receive a clean, for people that have a hard time standing with the bar, they catch the clean in the bottom, the bar crashes on them, they can't stand up. A lot of times people immediately look to leg strength. And they say, oh, he's got a, you know, your front squat is only a little bit more than your clean and jerk, or you have a hard time there. The first thing you should look at, in a uh, second thing, in addition to their leg strength, is the position they receive the weight. So when we talk about time to fixation and maximizing, or sorry, optimizing that stuff, optimizing your speed under the bar and the way you receive the weight. In the clean, we don't want to have a situation where we're dropping so low and so deep that the bar crashes on us. Obviously, if it's the you know, gold medal winning lift at the Olympics, then like, I don't fucking care what you do. You just have to lift it, right? But in terms of developing good lifting skills and developing technique, you want to receive the clean a little bit higher so that when you actually receive the weight, you have time to tense up your tissues in the, in the legs, you get in the right position at the bottom of the squat, and you can rebound properly. If you're catching it and you're on your heels, you're rocked backward, you try to stand, and just everything falls behind you, and that's it. You can't get up. First thing is to look at is the pull. So in terms of optimizing, we want to change the rhythm of how we actually receive the bar. Two variations of the, the clean would be like a power clean plus a clean, so we can reinforce receiving the bar just above parallel and riding it down and then a no contact clean so we can do the same thing as in the snatch. We're going to use less weight. We're just forced to use less weight in the no contact version because there just simply isn't, uh, there isn't as much power, right? So we have to reduce the load anyways. That's going to allow us to catch it slightly higher. But in addition to that, we're, again, pulling the bar as high as we can and then being more aggressive and faster to receive the weight, OK? So do a power clean, then a clean. I don't even, I mean, from below the knee or something. Good. And then actual clean. Right. Ideally, we want to receive the bar high and tight, ride it down, and finish the rebound. We don't want to catch at the bottom you know, with our weight on our heels, our ass down, back rounded, you know, and then like your eyes pop out of your head. You turn purple, and you finally get to the top. And everybody in the room is like, well, he's not making the jerk, right? <laughs> so then it's, you know, it's, it's pretty much a moot point at that uh, there. Um, do no contact one now. So same thing. It's not just about going under the bar as fast and low as possible. It's about tempo, timing, rhythm, maximizing those things, eliminating hesitations between pulling and receiving the weight. Again, things that maximize that too are you know, in general technique is maximizing your second pull. If you make a good crisp explosion at the top of the pull, you have an easier time moving under the bar. How many of you guys have ever done a deadlift? Right? When you're halfway up the deadlift, if you stop pulling, what happens to the bar? It starts going down, right? If you don't get an explosion, if you're not propulsing the bar upward and, and you're not imparting upward force to the bar, and then being able to move under, what's going to happen when you go under the bar? It's going down, you're going down. The bar is winning that battle, right? Unless you're very, very strong. So maximizing technique, developing a crisp, solid explosion is a great way to so sort of sort out those things where you, know, you eliminate the hesitations there are in the top of the pole, right? Solid connection here. There's time. There's separation between you and the bar. You don't actually have to 
uh, you're not standing there pulling forever and then dropping quickly. You're exploding, the bar's moving up, you're pulling against it as you move down. Does that make sense to you guys? So it's not just a do this exercise, it fixes your technique. It's a work on these skills, shift some of your training to things that are emphasizing the actual uh, you know, speed under the bar, receiving the bar in the right place, and then moving quickly under the bar without any hesitation between pulling and, and dropping. And the same in the jerk, obviously. You have, you know, if you're, if you're trying to split your feet really narrow or whatever, you're going to be in the same position, right? As, as you look at when you're talking about, you know, leg strength, you think there are better ways to get carryover from the front squat and the actual ability to stand up the clean? Like what we see with, with Alyssa, hmm. maybe mistakes that people make in the front squat or the positioning in the clean that limits their ability to stand the weight up? You know, there's, there's kind of like two different, I mean, there's a lot of different types of lifters, but there's, there's a couple different lifters. Some, some lifters are just very strong, right? They're going to develop a lot of strength really easily, and, and strength is never going to be, well, strength is never their weakness, right? So, so you're in a position where you can squat in whatever way is comfortable for you. If you front squat 270 kilos, you're not going to struggle much to stand up with cleans that are, you know, a lot lighter. Max said that because he front squatted 270 kilos. So, so, you know, if you're really yeah. strong in the front squat, yeah. let's say you do 270 <laughs> kilos. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, guilty. Uh, <laughs> no, but if you're if you're really really strong, if you have a huge surplus of strength and developing leg strength is not hard, then this kind of technical practice can take place in the snatch and clean and jerk, right? You're just going to do those lifts, emphasize them much more, focus on that. If your front squat technique or your front squat numbers are very, very similar to your clean numbers, then you may want to shift things to being closer in the, the way they actually look, the mechanical uh, execution of the lift. So if you front squat with your feet really wide, a little bit high, and your back is caved in, but when you clean, your feet are close, your back is straight, and you're more upright, those two movements have now become really dissimilar. And it's, not, it's probably not going to transfer as much. So if you're really weak in the front squat, you should front squat with a very similar technique to the way you clean, right? Again, transference and specificity are, are going to be paramount in actually capitalizing on the work you do. And, and right? maybe to even flip that, and I think what we see with Alyssa Richie right, the opposite. is that Al Alyssa, you know, she always had the problem where she couldn't stand up the weight. She has a really, really strong jerk, still does. I mean, one, 115 from the blocks when she weighed like 51 kilos. But she, you know, she couldn't for the life of her stand up a 115 yeah. clean. And as you watch her, watch her do a front squat and watch her catch the cleans, and I think for her, it's, it's more like, all right, you need to practice catching the clean yes, in the same yeah. position that she front squats, where when she front squats, her knees go forward more and her weight stays in her legs, where when she catches the clean, she gets rocked back on her heels and her, and her first move is for her hips to go up and back uh, as she stands up rather than her knees to stay forward and pressure in the front of her foot. In Alyssa's case too, this goes into like the long-term planning, right? Long-term plan for an athlete. She, her best front squat was like 100 kilos, maybe 102 kilos, and she could clean and jerk, you know, 96. And then her front squat comes up to 115, and she's clean and jerking, you know, 100, right? Or 103 or whatever. Uh, but there's a discrepancy where her front squat moves or goes up and down, but it doesn't affect the, the misses are the same. The misses and meets are the same. The long-term plan here is that we're always going to develop the general qualities because, for one, they're very easy to develop. We want to make sure we know her leg strength is not enough to clean and jerk 110 kilos. She's going to have to front squat 125, right? So in the long-term plan, you're developing general strength. You're always trying to get stronger in weightlifting, right? There's rarely a time where you're not trying to become stronger, okay? With technique, you're either maintaining the technique you have or further developing it, further improving it. You're never letting it regress, okay? So in her case, the general quality is something we're always working at. We're making her stronger. In addition to that, times when she's getting close to competition, technique is not necessarily a major factor because no one fucking cares what your technique is at a meet. You have to win, right? You gotta lift the weights you need to lift to win. 
the, the one month or whatever before meet, you're not gonna change things. And in fact, focusing too much on technique a month before meet in terms of changing something is gonna, you know, you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot because you get to a meet and then everything feels weird, right? Once you have solidified it and you've become, you know, you're ready to peak, then that's the technique you utilize going to the competition. Long-term progression, always developing strength. Short-term in, in training cycles from one meet to the next, developing strength early or developing technique early, solidifying technique, and then using that where you have it to meet, and then always in that process so that you're never in a place where you're basically hamstringing yourself at a competition by fixing technique up to the, you know, the week before. In the warm-up room. In the warm-up room. <laughs> I mean, that, there's coaches that are teaching people how to lift in the warm-up room. Uh, and then at the same time, in a, in the opposite is you're never going to sacrifice developing strength at the expense of, you know, well, now I'm going to become a really good lifter, but I'm not going to get any stronger. Because those two things are not going to go, they don't go, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. You have to become stronger. You have to become a better lifter. Once you become technically solidified and the technique you have is what you have, right, and that's about as good as it's going to get, and there's some exercises that will help you emphasize things and get a little better and a little sharper, but you're not going to change it much, you got to get stronger. You got to lift big weights, right? And so strength becomes be all and end all. All right, so let's take another quick break and then we'll come back with some Q&A. All right, we are back with Jug Life Live at JDI Barbell in Queens, New York. Yeah! They're getting it. They're good. This is a good group. Um, all right, so we're going to go to some Q&A, and this can cover you know, what we've talked about tonight in the snatch or really any weightlifting training questions you have. Any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. So you were talking about Alyssa Richie getting knocked back in the clean. Um, what would you do to try to fix that? Yell at her a lot. Yes. No. So shame. That's a shame is the main. That's motivator. a really common thing with people in that place where your legs, your your quads, really the front of your thigh is not super strong, right? So you rack the bar, you land in the bottom. The first inclination when you push off the ground is all of your body weight moves towards your heels, or maybe you land on your heels when you receive the weight. The ideal position. That, that's your your body trying to shift to the muscles that it feels are stronger hamstrings low back but in that very low angle like the bottom position of a front squat or catching the clean the hamstrings and low back are not well suited right. to move the weight right so when you receive weights when you front squat you have to have your knee traveling over your toe right super super important one thing to work on addressing it is to receive the bar a little bit higher right because generally those kind of people you probably can pull the bar pretty high right yeah, it'll be modest, right? <laughs> we, I was already doing it earlier with the squat stuff, so you, you can go ahead here. So when you receive the bar, if you're a little bit higher, meaning not completely at rock bottom, you have a little bit better position to start squatting into the, the bottom to anticipate the rebound. Let your knees travel forward over your foot. The initial movement right out of the hole needs to be pushing your toe down and keeping your knee over your foot, over your toe the entire uh, distance from the, the hole to about parallel, and then after that, it should be easier to stand up. And that, don't glaze past that cue of pushing your toe down. Right. We'll say to, to big toe pressure, because if you have pressure on your big toe, it's gonna be very difficult for you to have pressure on your big toe and shift your hips backwards. So that big toe pressure is gonna keep the knee forward a little bit longer, gonna keep pressure in your quads and allow you to use them to their fullest in the positions that they're best suited yeah. to be used. And then, you know, accessory movements, squatting is the obvious answer, but when you squat, you probably do the same thing, right? You probably shift backward a lot. So the big thing, the first thing we do is like belt squats, right? With a little belt around your hips, standing on the blocks. You can take a lot of pressure off your back and, and then force the pressure onto your legs a little bit more. Excuse me. That allows you to develop your quads a little bit more uh, with a little more focus so that you can actually get some traction in developing better technique that you can transfer to front squatting, right? If you're, if you're not able to use your quads because they're just so weak that you, you know, or your back is so strong, however you want to say it, 
you're going to shift pressure off of them. You have to do things to emphasize the opposite and, and put pressure on your legs, develop your legs more, and, and focus on that. Right? So the first thing I would do is like work on the way you pull the bar, work on where you receive it, work on the actual uh, like belt squat exercise and developing quad strength and some hypertrophy there. And then as you get better at that, then do more front squatting, increase the front squatting, and then work on receiving the clean better, right? Multiple reps in the clean and those kind of things. And the reason why the, why the belt squat will be so important is it trains the legs in absence of training the back. So if we're identifying this you know, imbalance, strong back to relatively weaker legs, and then you, you do a bunch of front squats, you can, you can front squat the same way that you're catching the clean. You can do this and hey, that kind of move where the hips are rising faster. And, you, know, you have to fight to hold the bar in with your arms. But if you do a bunch of front squats like that, we're not going to correct the problem. Right. Maybe your legs get stronger and your back gets stronger and your clean can go up, but you're still going to have the same limiting factor as you try and go heavier and heavier. So with no weight being supported by the back in the belt squat, the legs have to do all the work. You can pray too. That might, that might do it. Other questions? Other yeah. questions? Right? It worked for, it worked for him. <laughs> Performance enhancing deity on that one. Let's go you then you. Uh, um, so in terms of like accessory work and uh, stability, mobility, and strength, um, I'm, I'm looking at the upper body as well. Um, what type of exercises would strengthen someone to prepare them for that catch and the hold and the snatch um, as far as that catch and upper body goes? I mean, you know, the big one on that is, is you got to first assess the problem. If you're really, truly weak overhead, I mean, I, I know many people. I had a, a, a good friend of mine that could jerk 210 and couldn't, you could hold a gun to his head and he couldn't military press 75 kilos. Right, so having a super strong press being the, you know, thinking that first of all, is my issue actually that my upper body is weak or is it that I'm bad, my technique is off, I'm slow under the bar, it's crashing on me, I can't support the weight because I'm in a bad position when I receive it versus yeah, I should be more strong here because that's actually a problem. There's obviously stability things that play into it. You know, you don't want to have a 100 kilo overhead squat but be able to snatch, you know, 140, I mean, technically it'd be 140 overhead squat, but you know what I'm saying? Like where, where certain things are just so deficient, your upper body is so thin and weak that you can't, you know, you can't stabilize anything. Or That's the positions are so poor. Right, or the position is so poor. So first, the first thing you do, and, and this is the big thing for everybody, getting more flexible and getting into better positions, the first thing you should do is the actual lift, right? I would spend time with a lightweight or the empty bar and spending more of your time doing overhead squats, doing snatches. You know, make sure your range of motion is correct. Go all the way down, you know, receive the bar in the right place, squat down. Practice the actual movement first before you jump into grabbing a rubber band and a lacrosse ball and, and you know, foam rolling. Because what you want is specific adaptations. You want adaptations that transfer to weightlifting. The first place to get them is probably the snatch and clean and jerk, right? Uh, so in addition to that, accessory things that are important that, that you would do on some level, you know, there's, you know, from things like snatch grip push presses, snatch what, balance. Would you do those from blocks or from the rack? <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's, it's an inside it's joke. It's an inside joke, yeah. Uh, you know, those kind of things. You guys are all on the inside now, though. So. Those kind of <laughs> things on some level will help. I mean, you know, it's a lot of these things you're going to find that you'll do them for a period of time, maybe earlier in your career, but as you get really, really strong, as you get better and better and more proficient, they won't have that same dramatic impact they had in the beginning. And you, once you're snatching consistently and decently, you may not struggle to develop more overhead strength, right? You may not need to do a bunch of snatch grip push presses, you know, until you're doing, you know, 110% of your best for, for reps, you know? It's just not as necessary. So those things are good in the beginning, developing the general qualities. Anything, you know, in the same position, the same grip, close to the lift is, is what's worthwhile. So snatch push press, drop snatch, or snatch balance, overhead squats, those kind of things. And the, the phase of training has to be considered, too. If you're 24 weeks out from a meet and you're in, like, a very general phase of training where you might be doing more, like, quote-unquote, bodybuilding type of, of exercises, I mean, even dumbbell 
like yeah. dumbbell military press stuff. And the again, the lower level the athlete is, the greater improvement, the more general work is going to yield for them. Yeah. If you snatch 40 kilos, doing, I mean, you know, eating a donut might get you to 45. You know what I'm saying? Where it's a hell of a donut. What is like a deep? <laughs> it's like a deep ball. Very special donut. Deep ball donut. <laughs> it's got a lot of little pink things in it. But uh, so so, the point being, like like you just said, general things that would just make you generally more fit, more strong, are probably going to transfer well. As that effect wears off, as you get better, you know, they are not as crucial. Female lifters too for the upper body stability stuff. There's naturally less muscular upper body, so that the general training phase and the and bodybuilding type of exercises, uh, whether it's you know military press, dumbbells, barbell, even I, th I think a lot of the reason why we see CrossFitters, mm. uh, you know, CrossFitters as they transition to weightlifting, have a jerk that far outseeds their abilities in the clean. Well, if you've been handstand walking and doing all kind of handstands, like that's a great not only for the positioning, you know, if you're doing it really well, but also for the strength of uh, in the shoulders and upper body stability. I think that stuff can can definitely play a role in the general general phase, so furthest away from competition. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Um, you mentioned briefly when you were doing sort of the snatch stuff earlier about um, back position to start, whether it was like a more extended position with like your chest higher or more like neutral spine. And I think you mentioned that kind of either one could work, sort of depending on the position. Do you want to talk a little more about that? Uh, well, your chest being high versus your back being hyperextended are two separate things. So the angle and position of your hips and body are going to be determined by the length of your legs and torso. So once that's established, what I was talking about more is that you don't want to have your back hyperextended, right? Like Through the lumbar. Yeah, the lumbar back. So you're like really, really arched. Because what happens is as you move off the ground, you basically negate the ability to extend your hip, right? If you guys, are, if you guys all stood up and hyperextended your back and then try to flex your hip or, or uh, extend your hip, it's really awkward, right? It doesn't really work that well, right? You can kind of pull through your hamstring, but your glute and the whole hip is just not going to move well. It also can't your shoulders back behind the bar a little bit initially. So when we set up, when you pull, if you watch a lot of really good lifters, when they pull, their back is neutral. If not, looking almost slightly arched, it's not arched, but slightly bowed because the pressure is distributed across their back, right? And the weight's heavy. Right. So when they pull, when you watch, you know, Ilya, you watch any of these guys pull, their backs are straight. They're not hyperextended. They may, be, they may be trying to arch their back in the position in the beginning. They may be saying, hey, arch your back. That's what I try to do. But that's more just a psychological effort to keep their back tight, okay? Does it make sense? You want to make sure you can utilize all the links of your body, your legs, hips, torso, arms, to their fullest. By completely shutting one out, your hips, by arching too hard, you're going to lose the power at the top of the pool. And it's going to tie into to like a breathing and bracing pattern. Uh, as you're in that extended position, the, if, let's think of a, an empty can sitting on a table. As it's intact and you try and compress the can, it's pretty hard to do. You got to put some good force into that. As soon as you put a dent in the side of the can, it smashes right away. That dent in the side of the can is lumbar extension. It could also be flexion, but pretty much everyone knows not to lift in flexion. So that excessive extension is, is losing your ability to create really good pressure, 360 degrees of pressure, circumferential expansion through your abs, oblique, and obliques, and low back. So you're going to be able to brace much harder in a more neutral lumbar position. And then any kind of chest up position is going to come more from the thoracic than yeah. at the lumbar. Your chest up is, is more just a cue to lift your chin and, and keep your chest in, a, in this position, right? We don't want to be all caved over. Uh, in terms of where you, um, like where you turn the bar over, I've heard like, you're supposed to pull the bar to the same height every single time if you're doing the full lift. Where, like, say if you pull for the clean, you have to pull it to your like stomach every time you turn over, or pull to your sternum for the snap. If you're if you're just meeting the bar like wherever for the full lift, would that screw up your timing, or like, do you believe you should actually pull to the same height every single time, just like alter the force used? Well, by height? by default, I mean the only weights we care about are maximum weights, right? Yeah. I mean, in, in reality, that's what we're talking about because you can do whatever with light weights. 
but by default, you're always going to pull the same weight to the minimum possible height, right? That minimum height is going to be determined by a couple things. One is the physical limitations. How low can you actually receive the bar, right? Let's say that's the lowest position of the overhead squat in the snatch is 50% of your height, OK? So that's the physical limit of where you could possibly pull the bar to. If you were instantly fast under the bar and you pulled it to 50%, you could catch it, right? Not really, lot, not really reasonable. So the height you actually pull the bar to on maximum weights is going to remain constant because as you start lifting it higher, as you start lifting, let's say your best snatch is 100, and you can pull 100 kilos to 60% of your body height and still receive it, then you can pull 100 kilos to 70% of your body height and still receive it. Shouldn't you then be lifting 110 kilos or more, right? So as the bar increases in relative height, by logic, you should be lifting more weight. If you can pull the bar higher, you should be able to lift more weight. If there's other factors at play, meaning your speed under the bar is not optimal, or you're really, you hesitate, you pull really, really high, and you focus so much on pulling high that you're pulling the bar to 80% of your body height, you lose all that time you could have, well, all that distance, because now you have to go under, or you're, you're, you're sorry, you've pulled really high, there's a delay in that because you're focusing on pulling rather than moving under the bar, and then you become less efficient, right? So you're pulling the bar too high or higher than you need to to catch it, and then receiving it. So to answer your question, by default, by, by just deducing the, the question, the bar is always going to go the same height, basically. As you, as you get the bar higher with the same weight, you should add weight and go the same height. Make sense? You're going to pull the bar basically to the same position every time when you receive a weight, you're just going to get stronger, and the weight's going to get heavier. So yes. Yes. I see what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, the, the like point. In regard to like timing, though, like when you're doing like warm-up sets, in terms of timing of like when you turn over and how long you're pulling. That's be, like, so. The one thing you don't want to be is the fucking king of the warm-ups, right? <laughs> the guy in the fucking back who is smashing weights, and his eyes are on fire, and he's beat red, and he's got 65 kilos in the bar, and it's power snatch, power snatch, power snatch, and just shit's going everywhere, and you're like, that guy looks strong as hell. And 80 kilos goes on the bar, and it molests him, right? <laughs> so you want to you lift it's rhythmically. A, it Weinsteins him. <laughs> you want to lift rhythmically, right? Some guy, wow, you are, you, you are Chad, is, Chad is just crushing these jokes, and they are just, the reactions from the crowd are brutal. <laughs> you want to be rhythmic and smooth. Right? Not every lifter is the same. Some lifters are really violent and really aggressive you know, in their lifting, and that works fine for them. Uh, some lifters are just more methodical. right? But your technique should be mimicking the next lift. When you take 50 kilos or the empty bar, you're, what, what are you doing? You're preparing yourself for 60 kilos, 70 kilos, prepares you for 80 kilos. right? So everything you're doing is setting yourself up to develop and reinforce and rehearse the technique and skill and practice of maximum lifts. So in the, in the warm-ups, you know, your lift should mimic that to some degree. Obviously, the ability to become flawless or the ability to control the lift perfectly may be just out of your grasp as an athlete. You just can't do every single thing identically. But it should look rhythmic and, and fluid and, and smooth. How many of you guys, I know one guy will know him, Alexei Petrov, right? Very, like, Alexei Petrov is like the gold standard of technique, right? He's so smooth and perfect. His lifts, at least in the warm-ups, very, like, he'd do 110 kilos. He snatched 185. He'd do 110, and it looked exactly the same as 60 kilos. And 130 looked the same as 110. 150 looks the same as 130. Everything is just like a perfect, smooth robot, right? Just that's what I would say is probably more ideal, is to become efficient and beautiful and perfect with those lifts, rather than like I power these ones so they feel light, and then I go into the heavier one. Yes, that was a short answer. <laughs> hey, one, one more question, one more question. Now it's a lot of pressure to have the last question. Are you guys ready for the pressure of the last question? <laughs> um, so what would you recommend for a lifter that can't get into thoracic extension in the center position and do the first pull? <laughs> I would, I would, I mean, I would spend more time setting up in that position, right? I mean, 
there's no rule that says you can't just set up on a bar and hold the position for 30 seconds, right? And do that for you know 10 minutes a week total time, right? There's there's no, no reason you can't just practice that position. If that's not paying off, then start adding adding in other stuff that is probably beyond my scope, but you know that's other a, kind yeah, of more more a Dr. Quinn, Dr. Quinn, medicine man stuff, you know, mobility, mo that, that's you know, when therapy man, therapy man, sorry, uh, I've had a few. He, he loves, <laughs> he loves Dr. Quinn medicine woman jokes. Quinn Hanock has never heard right. one of those, in fact. Um, yeah, I mean, and then, you know, things that release the tissue and, and you know, release the tissue. That, Releases that the tissue. Relieves some of the tension in the, in that period of time and then working on the start position, right? You probably, can also. Probably the best, the best exercise, like a mobility type of exercise you could do to address it, you know, get up on the foam roller or something, but under load, uh, doing like a very s controlled eccentric straight arm pullover. So you could take the Try bar, that. the bar is probably even too heavy for it. You might want to take a PVC and put like a five kilo plate in the middle of the PVC and with keeping your ribs down, take the bar backwards and forward. But yeah. I'm, if I was laying down doing that, with some elevation at the T-spine, that'd be a useful exercise for it. Just let's take, blocks. Let's take oh, one more question. Your okay. question. <laughs> what if you have a lifter that has like the opposite lift? He's not pulling high enough, but he wants to get under the bar so much that he's not finishing the technique. Well, so total so, different podcast. That's a different. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're in a different. You're in the same kind of boat because what you're doing is trying to. You're you're slow under the bar or the weight feels heavy, so what you're doing is like trying to move under too soon. That's a problem with the pull, right? Focus on developing a better pull and practicing snatch pulls or, or clean pulls or whatever, developing the right timing, and then practicing the snatch and clean. In addition to that, you can do pull plus snatch or those kind of things. Even the same like hang snatch and block snatches will help, but focus on developing the right technique in the pull so that you can actually go under the bar at the right time. If you're you know, it's to funny that you mentioned that because I actually have something right here <laughs> that could be used. <laughs> so a, a lot of this, the technique stuff we're talking about, uh, Max actually addresses in this book, the weightlifting technique triad, because it's all an interrelationship of how high you can pull the bar, how fast and well timed you can go under the bar, and making sure that the bar is in that right, the correct position, the bar trajectory. Uh, so you know, being able to assess which one of those you may be deficient in and then choose the right exercises uh, to bring that up is you know, how, how you're gonna have very effective, efficient programming and not be wasting your time doing you know, exercises that you might love because you're really good at them because you're good at going under the bar fast. Yeah. So you love doing high blocks and high hang and, and uh, you know, no, no contact because you're able to have a really good result in it, but it's just, it's not, Fixing the problem of the right. exercises you hate to do, like powers or uh, you know muscle variations where you have to pull the bar really high. So you know it was funny that he mentioned that. It's planted him in the crowd, but this this can help you uh, you answer some of those. Uh, and that's probably a good a good place to to come to a close tonight. So uh, thank you everyone for yeah, for, coming, for coming for out. listening that's for funny. lifting. Um, upcoming events for those watching and listening on the internet, and actually for you guys here in person, we'll have another Jug Life Live event with a snatch workshop like this on Friday, April 13th at Max's Gym in Oakland. Uh, so you can register for that at the events section at store.jtsstrength.com. And then we'll be coming back to the New York area. Uh, Sunday, August 19th, we'll have the 2018 Juggernaut Performance Summit. That is uh, me talking about programming, Max talking about technique, Dr. Mike Isretel on nutrition, Dr. James Hoffman on recovery, and Dr. Quinn Hennock on Quinn things, movement, mobility, stability. I, I don't even know what to call it anymore. I don't know what the right word is. But uh, all, in, all in one day, it's basically like five 90-minute presentations and PowerPoints and all that kind of stuff on it. Uh, last time we did that, was last January in Long Island. Two and people died. <laughs> brains exploded. Legally, I have to say that. Yeah, bra brains exploded, so wear a helmet. 
Uh, but <laughs> Bill came from tw 22 different states uh, to attend this. In fact, flying from Vancouver, Canada, Nevada, America, uh, <laughs> all the way here to Long Island to do it. So whether you live, you didn't know, know that, did you? Whether you need to battle, you know, six hours to drive the 10 miles out there through New York traffic, or you're flying from another state or even another country, uh, I think there's no other event that combines sort of these these five foundational elements of training: program design, technique, nutrition, recovery, mobility, all into one day. That's August 19th, the 2018 Juggernaut Performance Summit. Beyond that, if you're interested in online coaching, we offer that, juggernautcoaching.com. Powerlifting, weightlifting, super total, power building, and strongman. Uh, go and ahead and check that out. We have a bunch of different levels of that, from our club programming, which is uh, more like a big group kind of programming, to team, which is sort of individualized by type, by experience, goal, uh, strength, and ability, and then one-on-one, uh, -on -one, which is you know, fully customized programming, so you can check that out there. Subscribe to our YouTube, three videos a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, uh, brought to you by the world's strongest videographer, Shorty Sedang. What did you deadlift at your meet last weekend, Shorty? 485 at 121. Those are pounds, I know you guys are confused by those. <laughs> <laughs> That's 220 at 55? 220 at 55, that's pretty fucking good, Shorty. Um, and uh, beyond that, the Jug Life Podcast. You can find that, uh, the video version, on YouTube, and then uh, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and thejuglife.com. If you like the Jug Life Podcast, go on iTunes. Give us a five-star review. Write us something, or something funny or nice, like Gilbert Grape 21 said, Max and Chad are a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of movie references, if that's your thing. They are both huge influences in my strength training, and Max has even influenced me to transition from powerlifting to weightlifting. In the words of Joe Dirt, keep on keeping on. <laughs> so if Mr. Gilbert Grape 21 sends me an email at chad at jtsstrength.com, we'll send you a shirt or a hat or something like that. Um, and that's it. That's the Jug Life. Max, where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram, Max underscore Ada, on Facebook, or you can email me at max at jtsstrength.com. And I'm Chad Wesley Smith, at Chad Wesley Smith, and at Juggernaut Training on Facebook and Instagram, filling up your newsfeed all day. This was another episode of the Jug Life Podcast. Thank you to JDI Barbell and yeah. Jesse for hosting. Thank you to all you wonderful people. And we'll see you next week. Are we going to the bar? Let's do it!